Hello and welcome back to Highway to Hoover, a production of SEC Extra over at D1Baseball.com. I'm your host, Joe Healy, joined as always by my good friend and co-host, Mark Etheridge. We are going to recap week weekend eight, question mark? Yeah, weekend eight um, around the SEC, fourth weekend of SEC play, nearing the halfway point of, of conference play. Mark and I are going to take you through everything that happened in a, a frankly wild weekend. This might have been almost certainly actually was the most like newsworthy weekend when you take into account yeah. we had a major upset we had a weird benches clearing situation <laughs> on saturday uh, we you know we we had some sweeps we didn't expect so yeah a lot to get into there so we will do that quickly but first i have to let you know that this episode of howie de hoover and every episode of howie de hoover is brought to you by pitch logic the system used by players, coaches, scouts, and instructors at all levels of play, from youth leagues to the big leagues. The easy-to-use and affordable technology makes the platform accessible to every player at every level. All the metrics and features used at the highest level. See PitchLogic.com for more information. Okay, Mark, um, before we before we get um, into the baseball stuff, and we got plenty yep. to get to, uh, so so bear with us today because it's going to be uh, going to be a, a, a quick moving show probably, but. Before we get there, we've got a little PSA for the listeners. Um, yeah. Mark had one heck of a weekend, or at least one heck of a Friday. Uh, yeah. Mark, why don't you uh, give us the lowdown on what your day was like Friday afternoon? Yeah, so I was on my way to Starkville. I was maybe an hour south of of the Mississippi State campus, and a lady crossed an intersection and T-boned me. I saw her coming. I tried to evade, and she hit me in the driver's side um, back seat of my truck I flipped multiple times uh, and I had my seat belt on and I saw her you know when I felt the impact I gripped the steering wheel and over I went and landed on landed on all four tires and luckily walked away from it I mean sore airbags all that good stuff I, I got a pretty good pop from the airbags but um but yeah i'm good and uh it was certainly it killed the weekend plans you know no baseball at least not in person um and then my wife had to drive all the way to starkville you know i live in mobile so all the way to almost starkville to to pick me up because my truck's totaled and now i gotta get a new one so any of you uh truck salesmen out there who want to make me a good deal uh hit me up um, but that's anyway, well, well done, Mark. Yeah. That's a good idea. I hadn't even thought about that. That's, that's a great call. Yeah, I mean, it was. It, I mean, uh, it was quite the uh, adventure, and certainly the adrenaline rush. As you realize just how close to death you were after you flip a truck a few times. So, um, so yeah, it was. Uh, it, it was just kind of one of those things. It was. It was so so surreal as I'm flipping. It was almost like it was in slow motion. You're realizing, oh, this is not good. <laughs> I'm going to get hurt. And then luckily, you know, as, as things came to a stop, I realized oh, I'm, I'm going to walk away from this. And, you know, that's and I got to see some good baseball the rest of the weekend, uh, at least on TV. So uh, all of that, all of that was great. And there's quite a bit to talk about. So let's get into it. No doubt. Uh, moral of the story, wear your bleeping seatbelt. Yeah, so that's my, it drives me insane when Save I me. don't wear just wear your bleeping seatbelt. That's all I got. to You say. never know what the other guy's going to do. <clears throat> that's right. That's right. All right. Yeah, let's let's do some baseball talk. We'll actually start off with something I want to get to briefly. Mark, you you and Aaron and Kendall recorded the first nerd cast of the season. And yeah. for those who, who don't know, the nerd cast is, is a colloquial term uh, we use to describe the podcast where the three of them put together the, the projected field of 64. They did the midseason edition last weekend, which I think going into it, I think all they all understand is a little bit of a fool's errand because yeah. we just know so little. So, but they do it as kind of well one because it's good content and, and you you guys read it. But secondarily, it's also a good exercise to kind of go through and, and get a feel for what the field is going to look like because I do think you can get some broad strokes. Um, some broad strokes trends of kind of where things are going. So Mark, why don't you kind of briefly give us the cliff notes if they've not listened to not necessarily where all the SEC teams fall, because they can go read that themselves in the site, but just kind of what the, the the big picture thoughts were with regards to the SEC and how the field broke this time. 
Yeah, I, in the, this first one, is it's almost like a dry run where you do it to kind of understand what the process is going to be like and kind of get the kinks out as you go forward. But the other part of this is, you know, at least this was my perspective and, you know, I won't speak for the other guys, but I think the SEC is as strong as it's ever been. And how will the committee view it? Okay. In the past, if you get to 14 conference wins, you're almost always in unless you had, you didn't do enough non-conference or less like really crazy stuff going on, you know, with, with the bubble at the end of the year. Sometimes if you get to 13 and occasionally if you get to 12 and you have a good enough RPI, you can get in. So what's this year going to be like? Because I think we all agree the SEC is the strongest conference, but you know, how do you view conference, you know, conference record? And that to me is, is going to be the biggest story because you've got teams like Arkansas and Kentucky who are already off to, you know, just a tremendous start from a conference record but that's probably not going to continue. And then you have other teams, you know, who are going to be right jumbled up there in the middle. And how are they viewed? Are they going to be able to host? Are they going to be, you know, two seeds or three seeds? Or where does all that land in the middle? And what about those teams at the end? What's the minimum requirement, right? You know, it's usually kind of like a sliding scale with the RPI and, and you know, and conference wins to get you in the, in the discussion. And what's that going to be this year? Is it the same? Maybe it is, but maybe it's not right. And and I do think with the way the the conference landscape is changing, not just in the sec, but you know, just everywhere conferences are getting bigger and a lot of the, you know, the power is being consolidated. Um, Maybe we need to reevaluate how we view conference records because so, so much of the power is consolidated into same groups who play each other. So someone's lose, someone loses. So um, maybe, maybe that's a big part of the conversation and maybe it's not. And, and that's for, for me, it's interesting to, to see where that's going to land. So that was a big part of the discussion. I do think that, you know, seeing teams that are struggling at this point, you know, and LSU uh, certainly Ole Miss, uh, Auburn, um, maybe after this weekend, Alabama's in that group. Well, how they're going to be able to write the ship to get where they want to go is is one of the big things that we'll discuss, not only on this podcast, but on that one as well. Yeah, I, I, I've kind of two big picture thoughts there. One is is mm-hmm. quick and because it's totally – we can't do anything about it right now, but next year there is going to have to be an adjustment of some kind yeah. because it's not just the SEC that's getting bigger. I mean, because mm-hmm. the Pac-12 is dissolving, the Big 12 is getting yeah. – I guess bigger, although they are losing Texas and Oklahoma, so they are getting yeah, somewhat bigger. Being reformulated. Yeah. yeah. And the big the Big Ten is adding some decent baseball brands. So like how does that like do we start to look at the Big Ten as like a you know, they're like kind of in that two to four range bid wise? Does it become three to five, four to, right. you know, whatever? Um and then the Pac 12 obviously just kind of going away. So how do you reallocate those bids? So it does open up a scenario where the 2025 bracketing process is Mm -hmm. messy because no one's quite sure how to evaluate it now. So that's one thought we have to set that aside. We'll obviously talk about that a lot more next year. However, for this year, I think you and I can't predict how things will be evaluated, but I would, I would urge listeners. I'm not, I'm not saying this for Mark's benefit because he knows this, but for listeners always remember that yes, This process is mostly a meritocracy. It is also a political process. Um, These are human beings on the committee. And I, how do I phrase this? Sometimes you hear stuff about like, hey, there's just, I can't go back to the committee. You know, if it's someone who, who is, who is stumping for, this just is an SEC thing. This happens with all leagues. They'll say like, I couldn't just go back in that room and stump for one more because I just knew there wasn't going to be the political, the will for it. I just couldn't make that case. Well, Um, and you know, anytime you have a committee situation, right, it's, it's what can you sell? Sometimes you have to give something to get something and vice versa. Um, So it's, it's a lot of it is what is the easiest thing to explain after the fact. And maybe that's not the best way to pick a field. Maybe we need to find another way to do it, but that's what we have right now. And, and while 
we have a committee made up of people who represent different conferences and schools. They obviously have their own agendas. They have their own jobs that they're, they're empowered to do and, and have to go back and answer to people. Um, it, 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 there is some, you know, conflict of interest there. And regardless of, of how much integrity they all have, you you know, we all, we all came from somewhere. We all have allegiances. So it's, it, it puts them in a difficult spot. No doubt. So it's just a good reminder that, you know, we can sit here and talk about how the, let's just say that 11th or 12th SEC team is better than mid-major conference team X that's on the bubble, but mm-hmm. that's not the only factor, you know? Um, so something to keep in mind is, as, as they continue, continue on. And as much as I would also say, as much as I would like for it to be a pretty straight up process where we're just looking for best on best. Um, I guess I don't have a lot of optimism that it will be viewed any differently than it has been kind of in the past where there will be kind of these like bare, these minimum, minimum viable resume cases, yeah. not just for the sec, but for other conferences. I, I just, as we've seen year after year after year after year with the over-reliance on the RPI, like I just have a hard time imagining we're going to see a paradigm shift with that this year where it's, Hey, here's a, an 11 win regular season SEC team with an RPI of 38 and they won two games in Hoover or whatever. Um, and that being enough, whereas that's never been enough before. Now there's always a first, right? There's always, there's always an exception, which becomes then, normalized, but uh, I just don't, I personally don't have a ton of confidence that we're going to see any sort of philosophical shift from this committee, which has been so, there's some sh- subtle shifts, but has been so similar, you know, the last decade at least. Yeah, that's fair. All right. Let's, uh, let's talk about the weekend that was, um, and Mark, here's something that I don't know that has ever happened on this show. And I don't mean this disrespectfully. I, I had a wonderful time there this weekend. I, I enjoy my time there. I know people like to get their jokes off about this program. We're leading with Mizzou. Um, sure. and, and genuinely, I had, a, I had a nice time there. Like, sure, is, the, is it not a palatial stadium? It is not. Like, and they're not going to lie to you about that. But, um, you know, I, I, but I, I enjoy my time there. There's something, there's something quaint about it that you just don't get in a lot of Mm -hmm. these 10,000 seat palaces. Right. Um, So it does have its, have its uh, charms, if you will. But the, the the highlight there is that Mizzou just straight up swept Florida. Um, And and there was some fluky is not the right word. Cause I I don't want to take anything away from Mizzou this weekend, but three, one run wins. And we kind of understand that one run games tend to be coin flips over the long period of time. They tend to wash out. So some of it, I think, is just the way the cookie crumbled this weekend for Florida. But I do think there are bigger, bigger issues here. I mean, obviously. Um, so I'll say two things before you can give me your, your two cents, Mark. Because I because I was there, I have a one viewpoint on it. But since you weren't, I, I'd be interested in your thoughts. But there was some criticism of individual pitching decisions for Florida. I saw today some criticism of, you know, why did you why did Cade Fisher throw when you could have gone to McNeely in a clean inning? Um, in the ninth, um, I also, in the game two, there was some thought of that Liam Peterson was in for a few batters too long, which I, I agree with. Um, however, the bigger thing, I think that was a factor, but I think the, I don't think it was the reason they lost that series. I think the, the inconsistency in starting pitching that we've seen all season from Florida reared its ugly head again. And then there was, there was just a lot of bad approach at the plate. It was a lot of swinging from the heels and looking fooled when you, you had to have known a breaking ball was coming. You're swinging two feet over top of it. Just, just not very good often, not sound offense. And by sound offense, I don't mean they weren't bunting and stealing. That's never going to be what Florida is, but it's just, they weren't putting the ball in play. It was a lot of empty at bats. So you could nitpick some of the individual managerial decisions, but I think this had a lot more to do with Florida just, played poorly and Mizzou played better than it has all season. I, I think that's kind of all it really comes down to. Yeah. I think for me, one of the things that, that stood out was just how few hits Florida got. I mean, I think they got two hits in 11 innings on Friday or something crazy like that. They And they didn't really have a lot. I mean, if they don't hit home runs, they have trouble scoring. 
and it's, you know, and then, you know, Sunday they get hits and they don't pitch. And Cags, who's been really good all year, couldn't get anybody out. I don't think he, what, he didn't make it out of the second? I mean, it was just, it wasn't a good, you know, it's kind of one of those Murphy's Law weekends where when you pitch, you don't hit, and when you hit, you don't pitch. And that's that's kind of what Florida did. Um, and this is a team that's been really good at getting the clutch hit when they needed it. You know, they won all these close games and walk-offs and had won every series. And then three days in a row, they didn't make the clutch play. And and they got swept. And, I mean, for, and you know, the next thing is hand it to Missouri. I mean, they took it. It was there for the taking, and, and they took it. And pitched really well the first two days and then got the clutch hits that they needed. And then on Sunday, they would score three runs in the ninth inning. I mean, it was just – I mean, they were against a really good pitcher. They were able to – to make the plays and, and you have to feel good for Missouri and Carrick because this is what they've been trying to build towards and get this belief that, okay, what we're doing here is going to work. We just need the time and they build a foundation and, and, and go from there. And, and it, it wasn't looking that promising early. I mean, we were looking at it. I mean, I did the research. I was wondering what is the worst SEC record that we've seen And you know, five wins, five and 24 was, uh, I think the worst. And they just picked up what two, three and four this weekend. Um, they're probably going to be okay. And you know, that that's not going to be a factor. So yeah, they may not make it to Hoover, but this is a really brutal conference and only the top 12 out of 14 make it. But they might, and and after this weekend, they put themselves in position that they're certainly in the in the running for it. I mean, they're they're not in last place anymore. So, um, from a Missouri standpoint, you you're uplifted. From a Florida standpoint, you know you've worried about their pitching, and you know I thought other than Sunday, they pitched pretty well. I pitched well enough to win. They just didn't hit enough, and that's more concerning to me because that's been the part that's been good you know, most of the year. So if you're not pitching well and you're not hitting well, then you're, you're, you're going to lose games. And that's where we are right now with the Gators. Yeah. It's such a good point about Missouri trying building belief. I mean, I, I heard a lot, even before the series, I did some interviews with some players for a piece I have coming this week and they, they talked a lot about it. Like we're, we're close, we're closer than people think. And I, I think mm-hmm. you, you saw that this week and, and we don't have to play pretend like we're mm-hmm. adults here. We Missouri swept Florida this weekend, but you know, as fun as a story as a B, I don't think we're sitting here. We're not going to try to lie to anybody and be like, you know, Missouri's about to just rip off a go on a tear yeah. here. Like, I, you know, I don't, I don't think we have to pretend like we think that's yeah. the case. But it is a little proof of concept where, oh, like, you have to imagine those players are like, okay, we're okay, we're we're good. You know, mm-hmm. like we're we're not going to get run off the field every day. Like, because you know, it's easy to to feel that. Um, you know, the first few weeks, and, and they've. The offense is what it is. It's a it's a weak offense. They're still struggling with it. They did score eleven runs on Sunday, so there's they got some help. Mm-hmm. But like they did score eleven runs, but they they have some stuff on the mound. Um, Javen Pimentel is yeah. just really knows what he's doing. Like veteran lefty who's just going to make you pound the ball into the ground. Another great outing over the over the weekend for him. Uh, Logan Lunsford turned in his best outing of the season on Friday, and he's just such a different look for people. You know, in a world where, especially in the SEC, it's a lot of fastball up, hard slider down and away. And he's, you know, he'll dot fastball a little bit more. And his thing is a big breaker that'll like, it'll drop down to like 69 miles an hour. And you just don't see that much of that in the SEC. And so it's a real change of pace for people to get adjusted to him. And when he's locating, he's a tough, real tough customer. But the, the, the most interesting arm I saw it's kind of a cool story um, that I, you know, I kind of want to cer- at some point this season, I think I want to circle back on and maybe do something longer on him or one of us should Mark, but named Ryan, Ryan Magdish. And mm-hmm. he's a Canadian kid who went to two different junior colleges last year was at division two, Florida Southern. Mm-hmm. And just one of those classic recruiting stories of one of Mizzou's assistants knew somebody who knew somebody who's like, Hey, I got this guy with a special arm that like, hasn't mm-hmm. really had much of an opportunity. And, 
Mizzou did their homework because they were like, well, is it a red flag that he's been at three schools now in three seasons and we'd be the fourth? Um, and, and they everything they got back was really positive on him as a, as a person and as a pitcher. And it was kind of electric, honestly. It's like 93, 96, and that thing is like – it's like the old Jaden Woods fastball. It's just like going up the elevator shaft um, and from the left side. Um, and so I, I, I heard from someone who had watched the Mizzou series against Arkansas – who was of the opinion that in that series, the best arm was Hagen Smith. The second best was Magdish. Wow. And is that Arkansas true? Arkansas has got some dudes. Right. Is that true? Like it could be Gabe Gackle, right? It could mm-hmm. be Brady Tiger. Like uh, the per- even this person, I don't know if they actually believe that, but it does show you that like mm-hmm. he's in that conversation. Right. Well, he's an interesting guy. Like he's not stretched out, so he's probably just going to be a closer. I say just in quotes, but um, mm-hmm. that's a fun guy to watch. So I say all that to say Mizzou's got some stuff on the mound. Um, and so at home, at least, it, where that ballpark plays huge. I mean, Cags hit a ball on Friday that would have been out of like every ballpark I've been in this season except for that one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, it plays big, and he can he can really shove it past people. So uh, a fun a fun. Um, Fun team to watch there, at least uh, on the mound. And, and honestly, it'll be an interesting storyline to follow this season, you know, how much they grow, because that's the other thing. My final thought here is that Mizzou's building this thing the old school way. I mean, this team is young. I mean, they'll sometimes have five freshmen in their starting lineup. And in especially for teams that don't recruit at like the high, high blue chip end of the spectrum, that type of building doesn't happen anymore. You know, you look at the rest of the league, the teams that don't, recruit blue chippers so i'm not talking about uh lsu or vanderbilt or tennessee or the mississippi schools i'm talking about you know Uh mizzou and kentucky and even south carolina to some degree even though they do get some blue chippers but those teams aren't really doing it with freshmen anymore they'll have some but it's a lot of portal it's still some juco um but mizzou is building it with young guys and that's a difficult thing to do because, you know, you lose guys to the portal, you you have yeah. growing pains, all of that stuff. But it's hard to keep them. Right. Yeah, they're, they're committed to doing that. And I'll be fascinated to see, you know, next few years how that how that works out. So fun little storyline to follow there. Yeah. Uh, mentioned Kentucky a second ago. Let's move on to Kentucky, Mark. Um, apparently, they're just not going to lose again. So I guess yeah, we're going to have to, I mean, <laughs> we're gonna have to get used to that they, idea. Tell me what you yeah. what you took away from this weekend sweep of, of Bama. I mean, they they just dominated Alabama from beginning to end, all three games. I, I forget the total score; it's like twenty three to three in three games or something of that nature. Uh, pitched very well against an Alabama lineup who who had been pretty you know among the you know conference leaders. Just shut them down. Alabama did not hit a home run all weekend. Um, I think. Kentucky might have walked two or three batters in the three games. Uh, meanwhile, drawing like 18 walks or something like that. Uh, it was just all Kentucky. And, you know, they've they've kind of been doubted and slept on and all those disrespected and all those kinds of things. And that's about to stop because they just keep on winning. And I think um, they're about to get all of all of the publicity that they have earned because uh, they just keep continuing to pound people. And it's not just that they're winning it's how they're winning. They're, they're playing really crisp. They're, they're taking the fight from teams and they're able to win convincingly. And then if you're Alabama, you, I mean, they're owing six on the road in conference play. I mean, this is a problem. Um, they're, I mean, they weren't competitive this weekend. So they've got to pitch better. They got to throw more strikes, and they got to find something offensively because Kentucky just made them look look silly. So that's a problem because Alabama has Arkansas and Texas A and M. They have them at home, but those are the two best teams in the conference, in my opinion. Uh, maybe throw Kentucky in there. So and you're going to play those three teams in three weeks, and two of them are still left to play. So you, if you don't you know, you don't hold your own. You don't split those six games. Alabama's going to have trouble making a regional, right? It, and if you you lose them both, you're really you're going to have to sweep somebody, right, to to get back in this. 
And this is a team that, you know, was ranked coming, ranked pretty well coming in this week. And after, you know, two bad road series, they're in trouble. I mean, they, they've, I know they've had some pitching injuries, but they got to, they, they've got to figure some things out, um, both on the mound. Uh, Alton Davis, you know, the closer, he got lit up today. I mean, just everything you point to that, that, that they've been able to, you know, rally around is, is just not working. I mean, even Gage Miller has been one of the best you know, hitters in the conference. He didn't do anything either. So it was just kind of, they, they've got to flush it and regroup and, and try to come back. And, you know, when, and that's the thing about this league, you have a bad weekend and, you know, of course, Arkansas staring at you. Right. And that's, that's kind of, you know, if it's not Arkansas, it's A&M and that's who they have the following week. So, um, so, yeah, it was a rough series for the Crimson Tide and great for Kentucky. Yeah, the thing, the thing that's interesting to me about Kentucky is is they, you know, we talk about them being a, a small ball team, and I think that was largely true last year. I've kind of come around to the idea that that's not quite what they are this year. They're now, the ball out of the park, man. Yeah, they can still bunt and they still run. I think at least coming into the week and they led the SEC in steals overall and in mm-hmm. conference play. So they're still going to do that stuff, but and they don't hit a ton of home runs, right? They're not doing what Georgia has largely done, mm-hmm. yeah. but they're barreling the ball. I think a lot of it is I think they're barreling the ball. I just the ball doesn't leave the park for them as much. Now part of that is their home park, right? I mean that, yeah. that's a that's a big park. So, so that's some of it. It's also been you know they're further north. The weather's not as you know not it's been pretty chilly there. There's a lot of reasons, but this isn't like a dink and dunk kind of deal. Like they're, they're hit, they're getting barrels. So yeah. it's a team that can play small ball, but this year more than last year, I don't think they have to. And, and right. I think that's interesting because it, it does create a situation where when you get into the postseason, you're going to have a regional or a super or, or Omaha, you're going to come up to games where the other dude is just shoving it. And you're going to have to put together a run with a, a single, a stolen base, a bunt and a sack fly. Mm-hmm. And Kentucky can do that. But in games like this one on Sunday where they just ran Alabama off the field, when they're feeling it and swinging it well, they can also do that to you. And that's right. that that's a place of privilege for them. <laughs> like and, and you watch them play. I saw some of their games when I was when I was at Mizzou, like in, just watching it in the press box before the Mizzou game started, that they just look like they're having a lot of fun. And okay, when you're winning, it's easy to look like you're having fun, but mm-hmm. I think there is something to it. Like the team looks really loose. So uh, the vibes are yeah, good, in Kentucky. Yeah, I mean, th- and that's the thing. I, I I would agree. I mean, it's we last year it seemed like it was a lot more bunning, and maybe it was just just because it was a novelty and thing. That could and, be. And they, that, that could and, be. And, and they do some of that, but I mean, it was a lot of you know hard hit balls and gappers, and you know, and, and they hit some home runs. They certainly out homered Alabama for the weekend. Uh, so it was, yeah. I w- I came away really impressed, and and think Kentucky's. Uh, they have some staying power. Uh, you know, the schedule does get tougher, but um, at this point, I, I think Kentucky's definitely going to host, and they're going to be in the top eight mix. It sure seems like that. I mean, they're they're sitting at eleven wins already in the conference, yeah. and their schedule has with with some what with what has happened to some other teams in front of them on their schedule. It is a tough schedule, but the only series where I would struggle to find the scenario where they win is when they play Arkansas, but that series is at home in Lexington. And so, you know, I would bet on them getting a game, right? right? Probably won't be the Hagen Smith game, but (laughs) they might get one of the other two. Um, So the schedule has kind of opened up to where like, heck, I, you know, I'm not really willing to put limits on this team at all anymore with the way they're playing. And and oh, by the way, another shout out, Dom Nyman, complete game shutout. Like, (laughs) and you just never know, you know, Lefty with good but not great stuff coming from Central Connecticut. How is that going to translate? Uh, and the answer so far has been pretty doggone good. So yeah. feels like a little bit of a found money situation with him on the mound because I think they thought he'd be pretty good. But I I wonder if you inject that coaching staff with true serum if they would have thought he'd be this good because I don't I don't know if that's true. Yeah, it's it, it's so so fun to see a guy who just really knows how to pitch come in and have success. I know we all get titillated with velocity and spin rate and all of that, but you know, it's those guys that, that know what they're doing out there, they can still have success. And that, that, that to me is, 
I mean, I love seeing that. I really do. Yeah. Agreed. Let's move on to Vanderbilt and LSU, Mark. Um, tell me what you think of this comp. You know, Vanderbilt wins two of three. Let's get the, the details out of the way. Vanderbilt wins two out of three in Alec Box. And, and you kind of thought going into this weekend, okay, LSU hit its hit bottom when they lost that game to Southern in the midweek. And, mm-hmm. you know, Jay Johnson comes out and, you know, has a kind of an impassioned thought of like, hey, it's a privilege to play here. You know, you're either – basically you're either about it or you're not. Uh, and they're doing no cell phones in the in the clubhouse and, and the dugouts and all that stuff. And you thought, okay, maybe we'll see, you know, a, 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 an LSU team with fire up its rear end this weekend. And, and they they came out pretty good, right? They win the Luke Holman start even when Luke Holman didn't pitch great. But then they lose the next two, and it frankly wasn't all that inspiring uh, the last couple of days. So I've landed on this comp, and, and I'm not saying this team is going to end up like the team I'm going to reference, but – as of right now, it feels similar. This feels a little like 2022 Ole Miss, where you look at the players in the roster and you're like, why is this team not winning more? Like, what is what is happening here? And it makes you wonder if, like, it's just stuff we can't see. Like, I, now I think we, we kind of understand in hindsight that with Ole Miss, it was kind of like a – they didn't have a vocal leader. They lost some of their, their, their you know, big leader types uh, the last the couple of years prior. So they were, there was a little bit of a vacuum there, and that played a role. So is something similar happening to LSU? Let's not forget they lost, you know, Cade Beloso, and Gavin Dugas, and and Dylan Cruz, and some of those guys were just, you know, load bearing walls, metaphorically speaking, of that yeah. LSU team. And so, again, I'm not saying they're going to end up doing the same thing 2022 Ole Miss did, but it feels similar to me in terms of there are some teams that are struggling in league play right now that makes sense because we can see the injuries or they're just not good enough, whatever. This team is not that. And and they it, it shouldn't be going this poorly, I guess, is my opinion. Yeah. Well, if they can figure out the, the bullpen, I think that for me is the big thing. I mean, Griffin Herring's the only guy that they can trust. I mean, he's it. And he's having to throw, you know, three, four innings, and then he's done for the weekend. And then what do you have? You don't have anybody who who you feel good about. So, like the second game, they had the lead and they just couldn't hold it because Herring wasn't there and there was no one else who could who could get it done. And this was a team that we we felt pitching depth would be the strength of the team. So you know, you look at Arkansas and they have so many pitchers. Who, who they can trust in high leverage situations. And then LSU has one guy, right, out of the bullpen. And and that's it. So until they can figure it out, and how do you, quote, figure it out, right? They've tried different, different pitchers, tried them in different roles. And, I mean, Vanderbilt scored in every inning on Saturday, every inning. Every pitcher who came in gave up a run, and they scored in every inning. I mean, it was – they're they're trying different guys. I mean, and, you know, the coaching staff is – hey, here's an opportunity. Show me what you can do. And it's just not working. And this was never going to be the kind of offense that would just carry you and beat people 12 to 10 every, every day. So they need to pitch. They need to pitch well. And the starters have been okay. They haven't been dominant like we thought they might be. They, I mean, they're probably league average. You know, this, you know, you take Arkansas out of, the occasion, out of the equation, they're probably hanging there with the rest of the team, but the bullpen is just not getting it done. And until that gets figured out, no, they're not going to make a run. Now, if it does, there's certainly plenty of talented pitchers out there they can. And if they do, then yeah, they're, they're, they're the sky's the limit. I mean, they could be an Omaha, but I mean, they're they're digging themselves in a really big hole, and they go to freaking Knoxville next weekend, and that is a really difficult place to play, especially when you're struggling, and you need to to be able to pitch to that Tennessee lineup that is, I mean, it's, if it's not the best in the country, it's one of them. And that's that's how you've got to get well, 
right? You've got to be able to get those guys out. So, I, I mean, I don't like their chances right now. Uh, I, I do think that, you know, if they can survive and get one at Tennessee, and maybe they can kind of get well in the back half of the conference, you know, it certainly lightens up. I mean, you look at who they played so far, it, it's been brutal. But they're just not they're, – they're not pitching at a high enough level to offset, you know, just an just an, an SEC average offense, right? So it's – it's a problem. It really is. It's it's disappointing for an LSU program, you know, that won it all. Now, I don't think they're going to fall all the way out and miss Hoover. You know, we all want to make the correlations of, you know, what happened to Mississippi State and Ole Miss. I don't think LSU is going to going to fall that far. But but I do think that they're going to have trouble uh, getting back in the mix of things. And they could even, you know, if things don't pick up, they could even be on the bubble, you know, come May and then need to win some games down the stretch just to continue their season. On the Vanderbilt side, the couple of cases of the the old Butch Thompson rule of players are allowed to get better. Mm-hmm. Um, one is Braden Holcomb got, got yeah. on the field a couple times, had a big game on Saturday with two home runs. It, it sounds a little like they're, they're still kind of using him situationally. Mm-hmm. Um, but if he's someone who can – I mean, let's, let's just face it, he didn't contribute much the first half of the year. Um if he can be a guy who can give them just a different look, a different yeah. feel, um, you know, he's such a physical presence mm-hmm. that getting him to be able to be something at the plate, I, I think is a big deal for a team that, that still doesn't have much of that particular element. The other is Ethan McIlvain who got off yeah. to a little bit of a slow start this season and has since uh, come on strong. And that's, that's big on two fronts. One is, is you'll take all the pitching depth you can get, but then beyond that, it's that, a lot of the success Vanderbilt has had in the bullpen so far this season has been with, you know, some of these freshmen who are good pitchers, but who aren't blow it by you pitchers, you know, Brennan Cyber and Miller green guy, Alex Kranzler. Um, Matt McIlvain is that guy though. Like he can blow it by you. And so they, they just, they were walking a little bit of a tightrope because, you know, in the sec with, with guys who need to induce some contact, if you don't locate that contact ends up being a hundred miles an hour plus, and that's a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, McIlvain's a guy who, you know, cannot have his best stuff, but can still get it past you. They, and they kind of needed that, that element. So, so two young guys, I think that if are showing signs of being able to add to Vanderbilt's depth as the, as the season goes on. Yeah, absolutely. And the, and I mean, they, they need those guys. I mean, these are two of the most talented players on the roster. Um, I mean, w- with Holcomb, you, you said it. I mean, he's a physical guy in the middle, you know, who could give you that, you know, that big, big donkey in the middle of the lineup, right? That people don't want to pitch to. And, and then with McIlvain, it, where, the, where, whatever his role, you know, he pitched pretty well in a midweek start a couple weeks ago. Um, you wondered, but I mean, their starting pitching's not been the, you know, not, not really been a concern. They, they pitched pretty well in the rotation. It's, if he could be that guy who could come in and, you know, give you an extended relief outing as he did, you know, when they won game two, um, I mean, he was dominant. This is this is as good as he looked against a good team. And, I mean, that's a true weapon, and it changes the math for what Vandy can be when you have a guy who's who's just that talented and is, you know, putting putting A and B together. And so, so Vandy, I mean, it's a big road win. And then for LSU, it's just a, another, just a brutal start to the season. The competition's been, been, been challenging, but they've just got to find ways to win, win series, especially at home. And that's, they've lost both home series now. Moving on to Georgia and Mississippi state. Uh, Mark, you, you, um, Mm-hmm. You carried that last segment, so I will lay out the facts of the case because I think people know yep. where we're going to start here in this, and then you can react to the um, yeah. your thoughts on them. So I have thoughts. <laughs> Saturday's game, late start, it was a you know a, a game that was on quote real TV, if you will, <laughs> like not not the 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 network plus, but on TV TV. Um, two two eighth inning. There's a play at the plate. Johnny Long at catcher. Dylan Carter of Georgia coming home. Um, there's a collision at the plate. John, 
Johnny Long, as Dylan Carter is kind of rolling away from the plate and trying to get up and, and, and move out, um, Johnny Long kind of gives him the business on his way out. Well, a couple of knees, you know, as, as Dylan Carter is kind of still on the ground. And kind of a funny reaction in the moment. It kind of looks like Dylan Carter's like, what are you, what are you doing? Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like a surprised look on his face. Um, so that obviously escalates things a little bit. Um, bench is clear. Thankfully, we didn't get anything really ugly, right? Um, yeah. But a bunch of folks run out and do the classic baseball thing of screaming at each other from their sides of the field. Um, it all kind of gets sorted out for better or worse. But we find out in hindsight that, oh, actually, there's there's this has big time personnel implications because, oh, by the way, these guys are ejected and maybe suspended. And, you know, there was confusion about how we ended up where we, we ended up. So those are kind of the facts of the case, such as they are. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, I guess the detail I'm forgetting is that there was a review process that took 40 some odd minutes <laughs> and it went back to a group in Birmingham as opposed to the on-field officials. And that's where the ejections out of which they decided to dole out the ejections they did. So, uh, Mark, what do you got on that cluster of a situation that we saw Saturday night in Starkville? One is absolutely um, just malpractice to take 40 minutes to review a situation. 40 freaking minutes to review that situation. Absolutely unacceptable. That cannot happen. Okay. Second thing, the, the suspensions or ejections seem to be really random. Um, I would love to understand the rationale behind who was ejected and who was not because the Mississippi State players were running off the field towards their dugout, M- many of them acting as peacemakers. You could, There's a great shot of Hunter Hines with his hands up. Hey, guys, don't do anything. He's ejected, right? He's running from his position He's got to run by the play to get to his dugout. How is he ejected for that? Okay. So it was just, it's just random. And then, you know, you had Georgia players wearing their hoodies. So you don't see their Jersey. You don't know who they are. And they didn't get ejected. Right. Cause you, you couldn't identify them. It was just really random how this went down. And then it was, for me, it was like, well, we're going to follow the letter of the law and we're trying to stop this, you know, stop this from escalating, but it really wasn't escalating. So what the intent is, is pure. I get it. You you don't want a a bad scene and people come leave the bench and, and do that. But let's think this through who, what player is going to sit in the dugout or sit at this position and just twiddle their thumbs while something like that's going on. They're all going to, they're all going to it. So you have to have a rule that, or an interpretation of the rule, we'll call it, that that understands the reality of the situation. You have video. So, okay, if someone is an aggressor, Okay, well, let's treat them, let's put them in this box and treat them accordingly. If someone is a peacemaker, okay, well, they're in this box and we're not going to eject them, right? It, it just seems, is, is, this, is this too rational? Does this in, require too much common sense to interpret this into a rule? And then you're going to take 40 minutes to do this. I mean, th- I mean, I've been covering college baseball for over 25 years. This was the worst, the worst uh, administrative officiating decision I have ever seen. This was terrible, guys. And and I, and to decide the game on that because you eject all these players, you got pitchers batting, you got pitchers playing in the outfield, you got outfielders playing in the infield. I mean, it was just absolutely a miscarriage of 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 justice right it was terrible i i don't know how how much plainer i can be this was as bad as it gets and the sec screwed this up and they did that from birmingham right yeah. so it, it's just a question of at this point and, and then you know you go back the next day and you go oh my bad um we're gonna let everybody play except for 
these two guys on each team and we don't really we don't really tell anybody why these these guys are are, are still ejected or suspended but everybody else has played my bad okay but let's forget about what happened yesterday when we kicked all these guys out i mean it was just it was just awful and hopefully some good will come out of this and they'll reevaluate how they make these decisions. Yeah, agreed. And, and as silly as it was, I, I, I was glad to see them come back Sunday morning and say like, all right, let's walk back some of this mm-hmm. because, you know, upholding all of that would have been to use a metaphor, throwing good money after bad, yeah. you know, um, it's like so, the adults showed up. Yeah. And so I just think it's, and this is not excusing it. Let me be very clear. I'm not, I'm just saying that I think this is, to me, it seems like a classic case of like, we hadn't had to deal with this in reality. And so we kind of were doing it in an ad hoc manner, as opposed to, you know, some of these other situations that arise where we have a very clear, we've done this before, we have muscle memory for it. This was just kind of a unique, unique situation to me that like, you start with, like I said this on this morning's weekend waypoints, like Johnny Long, ejection, suspension, fine. Right. Like that was clearly over the line. I don't care what Dylan Carter said. Like you can't knee a dude twice and like knock him over. Yeah. Like, and I don't think Chris Lavonis would have an issue with that ultimately. But yeah, everything after that, like it just was wild. And and Awful. Um, I just don't know why you couldn't just – Look, and here's the other thing, and then we'll get back on track a little bit. But if if you want to just let the umpires in the field handle what they can handle, right? Okay, Johnny Long, you're gone. Um, maybe Dylan Carter, and I don't think he did this. This is a hypothetical. Yeah. Like maybe Dylan Carter did say something that's truly over the line. Okay, he's gone too, whatever. And then like if we go back and look at the film in, in Birmingham and they say, oh, look, here's this other thing over here where this other person did something over the line, then let's handle that separately. Let's not try to like sort this out in the moment in the eighth inning of a two, two game. Yeah. Right. Or for that matter, if it was a seven, nothing game in the fourth, like let's not sort it out that way. Um, like you could have done some of this review stuff after. Yeah. You can't <laughs> like, take 40 minutes to make a, make the wrong decision. I, yeah. I think that that's really my, my biggest takeaway from this is you took all this time and this is what you came up with. Yeah. I yeah. mean, the, you screwed it up all the way through. Okay. And, and from what, what Lamonis said in the post game, it wasn't the umpires. Okay. Right. It, it was the guys on the headset. And, and that's for me, that that's a bigger problem because they should know better. Yeah. I'd love to, I'd love to know. And we may never know, but, or we, we, we may find out, but may not be able to divulge who we've heard it from and where, you know, it might just be yeah. one of those things we hear whispered while we're in Hoover or something. But um, I would love to know what the actual process was here. Like, yeah. was this the letter of the law? Because if so, oh boy, we got to talk about that. Yeah. Or was that, or was it just like these guys just, this was not the right process and it got mishandled because I'd believe either. So I'm kind of fascinated to, to, to hear what that ultimately, yeah. ultimately is uh, on the field. State wins two of three wins a, let's call a spade a spade, kind of an ugly game Sunday. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. I listened to a lot of it on my drive that I had to make. I made a long drive today. I listened to basically the entire game. Um, it was entertaining to listen to a lot of action, but it just yeah. wasn't, it wasn't clean. Um, mm-hmm. um, it, but I, I say this as a compliment to state. Those are exactly the type. If you're one of these mid tier sec teams. And I think that's what we feel confident both state and Georgia probably are somewhere in the mid tier. Um, these are the types of series, those games, I should say, those Sunday games are exactly the type of games you have to win to win series. Like yeah. that's just the reality of Sundays in college baseball, Good especially point. in the SEC. Like you're just going to have some of these ugly games and you got to win ugly. <laughs> you're just going to have to win them. And teams that do that are teams that tend to play baseball in June. So it wasn't pretty. I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to pull the wool over anybody's eyes and, and tell them otherwise. And, Oh, by the way, State got some bad news when Nate Dome came back and could only throw 11 pitches. All right. That's not great because considering he was out a month and he comes back and can only throw 11 pitches, we haven't heard anything definitive yet, but that's not good news. Like, I'm, I'm here to tell you. So, again, like, um, yeah. we don't have to pretend like it was some sort of masterpiece, but it's a, it's a big series win. 
um, especially considering what they did on on Sunday to come back from being down five nothing, and I think they were down seven to six, and then maybe eight to seven, or you know they were down a lot, and they just ultimately got it done. And there's a lot to be said for that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, you, you got to feel for Dome. I mean, come he hadn't pitched what in a month, and then comes back out there and throws to three batters. I mean, it's just you know the the injuries to to pitching. You know, you, you look at the major leagues and it's everywhere. Uh, certainly this league is, is no stranger to it as well. It's just it's where we are right now with with the velocity, with the, you know, you, you're trying to maximize what your body can, can do. And at some point, you know, that apparently um, the body's just going to reject it. And that's apparently what, what we've got here. So ho- hopefully we get good news from Dome. Uh, certainly he's a he's a pleasure to watch pitch. He's a great competitor. And uh, maybe this is just a minor setback and he'll be able to come back later. Let's uh, we'll get to the, the final three series here um, mm-hmm. and we'll speed through these a little bit more just because these series feel like they kind of went to to form here. Yeah. So let's we'll start with a and in South Carolina. A&M wins, wins two of three on the road. South Carolina salvages a game on Sunday. And, and this was going into this weekend. I, I said in the weekend preview that, look, if, if a and is the number three team in the country, this is the type of – road series are hard to come by in the SEC. We've hammered that home a million times. Mm-hmm. But this is the type of road series the number three team in the country should come in and, and make a play to win. And they did it. And yep. you know, the lineup continues to, to mash. Um, the pitching has backslid a little bit, but it's it's been good enough. And and when you combine that with the fact that, you know, South Carolina's South Carolina's starting pitching just didn't really show up this weekend. Um, that that was a a formula for A and M taking care of business against the Gamecocks. Yeah, I mean you you covered it. I mean just you know that A and M offense is so tough to pitch to, and they were able to to get into the South Carolina bullpen early, and really all three games and. As a result, they were able to to, to get the win. I, I think the thing for A and M is they do have some bullpen pieces. You know, last year, you know, they were, they were kind of short, and if they didn't get a good start, they were in trouble. And this year, you know, they they've gotten good starts for the most part. But if they don't, it's not the end of the world because because the, the, their options and and we saw that this weekend, and that's how they were able to to take another series. Yeah, that's um, it's a good point. And and some of the guys, it feels like some of the guys who were a big part of the bullpen last year that are back this year have benefited from mm-hmm. not having the world on their back. I mean, they're they're not like the uh, you know, the, the sculpture of Atlas holding the globe. Right. On, like poor Evan Oshenbeck last year <laughs> was like, yeah. this dude's gonna throw eight innings every weekend <laughs> in two different games. Um, but he could still do that, right? Oshenbeck threw well. Shane Sadeo threw really well in the Saturday game. So. Yeah, it just feels like the the division of labor is a little bit better in the mm-hmm. in the A&M bullpen. And if you're South Carolina, I think my big takeaway here is that they now are in a situation where they have something to prove. Feels like they're back on their heels a little bit. Um, we were feeling pretty good about the pitching. I certainly was. Um, but they, they have speaking of backsliding, they have backslid backslid the last couple of weekends. Um, and when you combine that with the fact the offense has always been more like good than great. Um, you know, they're going to, they're going to really have to battle the second half. I, you know, it, certainly if they want to get back into like a hosting discussion, they're really right. going to have to do some work the second half of the, of the season. Um, let's talk Arkansas Ole Miss, Mark, a sweep for Arkansas. I don't want to say ho-hum because I don't want to just gloss over excellence necessarily, but you know, it's another sweep. It's Hagen Smith, six innings, four hits, two runs, 11 strikeouts. <laughs> like that feels like his average outing at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's great. The bullpen showed up because Molina and Tiger weren't perfect in their starts, but the bullpen just picks them up time and again, like tail as old as time at this point. So for me, it's the Ole Miss side of it is, is perhaps more interesting, at least more timely because we talked about LSU being giving yeah. a little bit of the 2022 Ole Miss vibe where it's like, this team is talented. Why are they not winning? This Ole Miss team feels different than that, not because they're untalented, but just because it, it's becoming increasingly difficult to feel overly optimistic about like where where does the big improvement come from, right? 
Um, well, whereas, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, on one side, they were competitive in all three games because, you know, the Kentucky series, they really weren't, you know, especially this last two just it got away. So they were in all three games. And, you know, from that side, you, I mean, you're playing the number one team in the nation. The problem is the math. All right, you continue to lose games, you you continue to get swept, and I know you play Kentucky and Arkansas, and they're what twenty two and two um, the last couple of weeks, and they're going to be a lot of people, but it's just the math is not working for you. You just got to win so many games down the stretch now, and you know, big rivalry series with Mississippi State coming in, they come to Oxford. Um, it's kind of do or die time for for Ole Miss. I mean, they have to win that series. And then, but even that only takes you so far when you're, you're, you're digging a hole like this and with what they've shown you so far, what they've shown us so far, I wouldn't pick them to beat Mississippi state right now. I mean, they they just haven't shown us enough, even at home. So it's, it's really kind of one of those, one of those weekends where this is, I know it's week five of conference play, but this is super important. I know it's important anyway when these two teams play, but it's important for your for all your goals for your season. You you've got to step up this weekend, Ole Miss, or or things are gonna they're gonna spiral and you're gonna be, you know, trying I think it's a better team than it was last year, but you know, it's it's you're starting to get these these concerning vibes and that's yeah, it's not where we wanted to be. If, you know, if you're if you're a rebel fan. Yeah, there's also just other other little cracks in the foundation too. Where I mean, they're 18 and 14 overall. Yeah. I mean, you look at some of the games they've dropped. You know, High Point, right? Um, you know, Memphis, at the time we thought their weekend. Iowa. Yeah, I I thought at the time we thought their Iowa series win was good. Now Iowa's kind of you yeah. know falling on their face. Um, you know, they, they, you know, mid, another midweek loss this week. I mean, it's just, there is, it's not just the weekend results. They've just kind of struggled in general to get any sort of like real momentum. Right. And if you really want to nitpick and, and I understand we can do this with every sec team. Um, this is not, this is not to unique to Ole Miss, but you, you look at that series against South Carolina when they won two or three at home. And now you're starting to go like, okay. How impressive was that really? Right. Um, so, and again, I don't want to get too deep in because you can, you can do that with almost any SEC club, you know, a series win that doesn't look good as now as it did then and vice versa. So anyway, but yeah, it's, it, your point is well taken. This team, I, I'm pretty confident is better than last year's team. It's just that I think they'll win more than six SEC games, but the ultimate result might not be much better ultimately. Because right. I mean, they, they really have to get moving. This series this weekend is big against State. It's in Oxford, which in theory is helpful, but I think I heard the other day something like they haven't won a series against State in Oxford since like 2015 or something insane. Uh, <laughs> you know, yikes! And and so I don't. It's something like that. Um, but yeah, so it, it, it's not the. <laughs> it hasn't historically the last 10 years or so been the advantage you think it would be. So. Mm-hmm. Um, Anyway, so yeah, Ole Miss just in a in, a, in not a great place. Got to get moving if they're gonna. Honestly, they got to get moving if they're gonna make it to Hoover. Much less anything bigger than that. All right. Um, speaking of teams that are gonna have to get moving if they're gonna make it to Hoover, uh, Auburn loses two of three to Tennessee. Started off pretty well. They win the opener. Um, they just put it on AJ Causey. I think it eight mm-hmm. runs and one and a third or something like that, which table that for a second because you know that that is a thing about Tennessee we'll have to start asking questions about but um you know Auburn I think it's it just is as simple as they're they're not getting enough pitching right now the offense right. keeps them in a lot of games but then you see like Sunday where the offense isn't doing as much and they just get completely rolled over yeah I mean it's a you know, the offense is doing its part but I mean Butch shuffled the pitching, the, the rotation this weekend. Just, you know, bringing the guys who had been starting, bringing them in relief. And after Friday, it didn't work. I mean, they, they got good pitching Friday after the starter left. Two two really good relief 
appearances, and then that was pretty much all. I mean, Tennessee just demolished them, run rolled them twice. It's just – so they've got to figure it out. I mean, this was at home. You, you've you just got to put up a better a better outing. I know Tennessee's really good, but you can't give up, you know, 30 runs in two games. So it's – you know, for, for Auburn, it's the same kind of situation. The schedule has been brutal, but – You've just got to do more. You can't get swept. You can't lose home series because, you know, there's just the math's not going to work. And they've got Kentucky next weekend. They got them at home. That's, you know, like we talked about with Ole Miss, this is kind of one of those series where your back's against the wall and you got to see what you can do. Um, and that, and Auburn's just, I mean, it all starts on the mound with them. Uh, we all look back to last year when they made the great second half run, but I mean, they weren't in this big a hole. So they, they've got to, they've got to get moving. Um, maybe they're, you know, you're not going to get back and win 17 games like they did last year, but in order to make the postseason, you're, you're, you're going to have to start winning some quickly. You, you can't, you can't keep dropping home series. You can't keep, uh, getting swept on the road, kind of, kind of like what we talked about, you know, with LSU and with Alabama. And I mean, Ole Miss. A lot of these teams are in the same, same kind of area, and they all have different, different kind of issues. But, um, but they, they're all facing the same kind of um, goal, and they're trying to to just get some momentum and start winning some games so they can get back in the picture. On the on the Tennessee side, um, I mentioned a dialogue about AJ Causey. Um, he, you know, he was good there for quite a while this season, but has really kind of run into a little bit of a of a wall of late. And um, you saw that most notably in, in this start, where he gives up eight earned runs in one and a third innings. Um, now they were in that game because they also scored five runs against Dylan Watts in in inning a third. So, I mean, that was a bizarre game where all the runs came in the first two innings and then it was like, you know, quiet the rest of the game. Mm -hmm. But so that is a concern, especially when you, when you combine it with the fact that AJ Russell's status is so up in the air, right? Um, You just don't know when he's coming back, if at all, it's kind of feels similar to the Nate Dome situation where it's like, just hoping he comes back and they tried it and, you know, and him coming back, Russell looked okay, you know, but now he's back on the shelf. And, and so there's just some, some uncertainty about that, but, you know, cause now sitting here with an ERA over 10 in, in sec play and drew beam pitched better, but drew beam also has an ERA over five in sec play so far. Um, now that they do seem to have found something in the, in the finales with the, the secret Nate Sneed, piggyback situation but i bring that up only to describe like where they where tennessee shows to be a little more vulnerable because man this offense if you're struggling on the mound this is not the offense you want to see they run rule auburn twice to finish the weekend and a a notable thing blake burke is now the tennessee all-time home run leader Mm -hmm. and that kind of surprised me honestly not because blake burke's not a great power hitter obviously he is but but two things surprised me one is you know tennessee's been playing baseball a long time and they had a lot of success if you go back to the Todd Helton, Chris Burke, the, those years. So, I, you know, I kind of thought surely somebody, when those bats were, you know, minus five in the 90s and early 2000s, had more home runs. But nope. And then secondly is let's not forget that Blake Burke has really only played two full seasons by now. And you know, we got less than 100 at-bats as a freshman. And, you know, he hit 14 home runs, big part of why he's where he is. But then so he does a full season last year and then has half a season now. So in two seasons. He has, he has held that record. And don't look now, but Christian Moore is not far behind him. Those two guys could be one and two by the time they finish their careers, likely at the end of the season because they're both considered uh, you know, high-end prospects for the draft. But um, So kudos to Blake Burke for getting there. I was, I was a little surprised to, to see him get there, but uh, it's a, obviously a well-deserved honor. Yeah. You know, that, that Tennessee offense is just, I mean, that, that's as good as perhaps anyone in the, in the country. Um, I was talking to Georgia head coach Wes Johnson this week for a Charlie Condon feature that we're running next week. And he, he mentioned that, I mean, Tennessee is as good an offense as, you know, certainly he's seen this year and in several years. I mean, it's a really, 
a potent lineup. There's just they've got multiple guys hit for, hit for power. They've got speed. They it's just kind of kind of really a nightmare for for, for pitching coaches and, and pitchers uh, that, that are going to face them this year. So um, if they pitch, and you know sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But if Tennessee pitches, then they're they're going to win a lot of games, and and that's kind of. You know, you say that about a lot of teams, but that offense is is a handful. And they've been doing it without Billy Amick. Yes, <laughs> so good even point. more impressive. He, he's been out for a couple of weeks now, and so yeah, doing it without him and having the luxury of of not having to rush him back is 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 a good place to be. So, yeah, I, to me, that's still the best offense in the SEC. I, I've not looked at the updated stats on that, but that's what my, I mean, A and M's obviously that discussion as well, but. It, my eyeballs tell me Tennessee is the best offense in the SEC. We'll, we'll obviously yeah. see as, as time it's just, moves on. They're just so deep. I mean, the, I mean, it's 12, 13 guys. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, they've got, I mean, they've got guys, part-time guys that are, are you know, like they have Reese Chapman sitting on the bench and he's, you know, 15 for 41 this season, which is a 366 right. average, and he has a 500 on base percentage. Like, I mean, that, that's the guy they have sitting around on the bench. For the most part, mm-hmm. so yeah, ab- absolutely, the incredible depth there. Uh, all right, Mark, that was a jam-packed episode because it was a jam-packed week. Um, yeah. A lot to get to. Feels like we're starting the 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 oil and water separation of the SEC. Feels like it's starting. Um, some of that will change, but we're at the point now where I think we can start to make some some broad um, judgments on things. Um, this weekend, I think was a was a step certainly in that direction. That is going to do it for this edition of Highway to Hoover, a production of SEC Extra over at D1Baseball.com. Thank you to everyone who's gone on to their podcast app of choice and given us a rating and review and all that good stuff. I have noticed those coming in. Uh, Continue to get those in if you have not done that. Mark and I greatly appreciate that. It it helps the visibility of the show um, and and helps the show reach reach other people. um, and, And we're humbled by everyone who has already done that. Uh, so thank you for doing that and for listening. Thank you to Pitch Logic for sponsoring this and every episode of Javier Hoover. And thank you to Mark for joining me as always.